Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks everyone for coming. I was not expecting that many people, but uh, I mean, this is definitely a topic I'm pretty passionate about, improving the quality of Linux and making more people use upstream rather than having their own forks, you know, older versions or whatever. I don't like this approach, so that's why I'm very passionate about this topic. So I'm Martin Perez. I work at the Open Source uh, Graphics Center uh, in Finland for in Intel. And I've been working on the Intel Graphics CI uh, almost since its inception, so that's about two and a half years ago. And uh, as the title say, uh, says, we're going to see how we can do validation the Linux way. And first we need to know what the Linux way actually is. So that's why we're going to first go through uh, the unique development model of Linux. It, and, uh, and then how do regressions get in and how to prevent that. And we'll use uh, Intel Graphics CI as a case, case study because it really is different from the other, the other solutions. And then quick conclusion. So some numbers here, <coughs> not everything is important, but what you can see is that there's a lot of drivers. A lot of drivers, a lot of developers, and it's one single tree. So the crazy thing is that there's a new version coming every t basically two to three months with 14,000 commits there and an average of eight commits per hour in average. So the traditional way of doing validation here is definitely not going to scale. So what do we have? So this no architect, which is one of the features of Linux, so it's this bazaar type of development rather than the cathedral, which has been a very successful model. So we, yeah, there's no architects, but there are rules. So if you make a user visible regression, the code has to be reverted. That's the first thing. Second one, um, especially that is true, especially for the, the DRM subsystem. If you make a kernel feature without user space that, that matches it to actually use the feature, then it's not going to be accepted. So I think this is the reason why the, um, the well, Linux went from being a niche operating system. I mean, come on, it just started by a student making something, announcing it on a mailing list somewhere. Hey, look, I made something. And then someone took it and started adding stuff to it without regressing the feature set. So that made it more interesting to more people. And as contributions come in, it increases the scope and um, or the, the user base, basically. So I think this is why it has been so successful. This strictly improving uh, every version. But however, in practice, you know, regressions happen. I'm sure you all had this. And uh, this is why a lot of um, companies just freeze the kernel and say, no, we don't update it because this is too scary to update this. So we validated it throughout our processes that took months. And uh, yeah, this is it. So that's why your phone is running terribly old kernels. And I think this dilutes the Linux development. So if everyone could be working on the latest version, that would be beneficial. So that's why I would like to fix it. So how do we prevent regressions? <coughs> So as I was exp uh, hinting before, Linux is a validation nightmare. So one code base with a lot of sharing between drivers, code sharing, and then the, the release cadence is just insane, two to three months. Developers, well, they usually only test on the particular machine they have at hand. If they have two, it's like, yay, got two. But come on, it doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't, um, it's not representative of all the systems that are running Linux. I mean, what doesn't run Linux anyway? <laughs> so because of this, because we have so few unit tests inside the, the kernel, so that means that even the parts that are hardware independent are not actually properly tested either. It's, um, um, yeah, it's a big problem. And then, yeah, we, we don't have that many self-tests, these new tests that are inside the Linux kernel. I uh, didn't know exactly how to count them, uh, so I found something like 600, so I rounded it up to 1,000 because, well, I mean, the scale just shows that one test per driver, like, yay, that's quality. <laughs> so, yeah. So why traditional QA cannot really work? Well, there's too many hardware and software configurations. It's just no way to know. I mean, 
even when you write code for, for Linux, you don't even know how it's going to be used by other people. That's, that's the beauty of Linux, but it's also the, what makes it difficult. And also something difficult to explain to marketing, like why they should be investing more money in Linux development and upstream. It's always the same problem. We don't know our users. So that's why we need to, to make sure that, or at least as a user, you need to make sure that there are tests that are actually capturing what you're doing and making it so that it can be executed uh, automatically so you can more easily test for regressions. But we're not there yet. So there is this. Then, um, well, two to three months release cadence. Well, a, a lot of the, the validation cycles, they take weeks, even months. So how can you test everything? And by the time you actually <coughs> validated something, it's out of date. So what's the bloody point? So that's why people use yeah, stable. I mean, yeah, companies usually uh, focus on stable trees. And well, what do we get then? Well, Linux is uh, basically tested by users. So that's, that's what it is. But actually, few users use it because, well, they don't want to break the system. They also need to rely on their machine. It's not just for fun that, that they are running Linux. So here is why we do get regressions. So why do we need CI then? Well, I think that the, the, the big value of Linux is that the um, cost of integration has been put on the person making the change. So that means that if you change an interface and uh, another driver is using it, you need to make sure that this driver is not going to be broken. So if we use the same logic and apply it to testing, we can say we can provide a testing system that is going to tell you, hey, you are regressing or not. And so this way we can uh, make sure that if something is wrong, you don't have to go and uh, file a bug later on or something. It is something that can be caught pre-merge. And that means less time spent on bug fixing, uh, fewer bugs also. Um, the tree keeps working. It scales well with the number of people, as long as your testing system scales, which is one of the challenge. Because, well, you know, if you have uh, 10 people pushing patches to the CI system, it's one thing. If you've got, well, 1,000, it's going to be another one. So, of course, yeah, you need some decentralization here. And um, I'm also saying that the test system needs to execute tests that are public. Otherwise, if, let's say that uh, as, a, as a developer, I make a patch to um, a subsystem I don't know, and uh, the test uh, the test system just tells me, hey, there's a regression here. And so I'm like, okay, cool, but how do I know what the test is doing and what do I do to fix it? So that's why we need to have uh, open source test suites. And uh, well, the Linux development model is not everyone is working into the same tree. Everyone has their own fork or, or, or branches, and then the patches flow towards Linux storables. So that means that when in your integration tree, sometimes you need to do back merges. You take the latest version of Linux and you put it back into your tree. And when you do so, you get thousands of commits. It depends on how often you do it. So what do you do when this happens? Because you can make, make uh, the traditional CI way is everything has to be green at all time. And when it's not, the world is broken. Um, so when you have a model like this, when you, you get a lot of commits uh, periodically, you can't really have a model like this. You need to handle... Uh, well, not you need to basically have the concept of known issues, and uh, and these known issues need to be filtered out from the testing reports, so as that um, people can actually trust it, and not just say, ah, oh, it's not my problem, it's someone else's problem, so I can push my stuff, and then actually it was their problem. So yeah. So what do we need to have actually in the te in the pre-merge reports for developers? Well, there's quite a lot of things, actually. Um, so at first, you need all the information about the hardware, so the machine. You can get a reasonable output from DMID code and kernel logs and, and what is the display configuration. I mean, we do graphics. So. Then you need the full logs of the execution of the test and the tests that were happening before. You need to push the, the different versions that you tested, so the the Git version, I mean, to different trees so you can make sure that uh, people can reproduce. And if possible, you should also push the, the build artifacts, the, the actual compiled versions. This way, if your compiler was odd, then it can be checked. <coughs> 
So um, really what the ob is the objective here is only show the, ch the, the, um, the impact of the changes made by the developer. If you add more things, it's just noise, and it um, increases the chance that the developer is going to ignore your, your um, report. So, and this is because integration testing is very noisy by definition. Um, well, you, how many millions of lines of code are you uh, exercising with just, I don't know, calling the suspend function, for instance? It's just writing one bit in a file, right? And boom, you get not only the kernel, but all the, I mean, the, like the x86 part, but also all the drivers that need to, go to suspend. And then after this, you've got the bias. So that's, yeah, th that's insane. And then the hardware, of course, can be flaky and not come up, or the RTC clock can be broken. Like. So yeah, that's what it is. So it is extremely noisy, so we need to find a way to, to contain this noise and, and say this is a known issue. So we need to uh, be able to take these known issues and label them and filter them out. And in the end, show also the list of components that change. So if you change multiple things, like your test suite and the kernel and, and something else, the BIOS version, whatever, it needs to tell you, because otherwise it's difficult to keep track of things. OK, so how do we filter known issues? So we need a tool for this. And the tool needs to be able to take uh, the so-called post-merge results. That means the executions that you do when it's not a pre-merge request. And uh, you need to create these signatures or filters that, um, that well, either you do it manually or automatically. And these signatures need to be associated to bugs. And this way, you can have this uh, place for communication saying, OK, well, I understand what this is coming, where this bug is coming from. Here is what we should be trying. And so you have a forum of discussion. It's very nice. And. Um, and then when you have this, you're going to get a shit ton of failures, because every single failure that you have in your, in your integration testing is going to be a bug somewhere. <coughs> so you need to prioritize. And uh, for this, you need tools, again, that tell you what is the impact of a certain bug, what is the reproduction rate, and which machine it's seen on, and things like this. And of course, if you can trigger an auto bisect on this, this yep. So this tool is actually existing, and I've been working on it for quite some time. And it finally got open sourced this, uh, I mean, last Friday. I mean, not this Friday, the one before. <laughs> so I was expecting to open source it for the last post them. It just took freaking forever. So this tool is called CyberGlog. It's uh, hosted in uh, GitLab on freedesktop.org. So go and check it out. And um, because I I'm, I'm believe in dog fooding, I made this tool, and I wrote the, the, the issues myself. And yeah, I wrote more than 700, 700 bug reports last year. And that actually was just nine months, not even a full year. So yeah, interesting days. Even right before the presentation, I was filing bugs. Enjoy. <laughs> but hey, here is an example of a report that the CI system is giving. So here what it says is, at the top, what is the different configuration? So it goes from uh, CIDR and blah blah to patchwork, so that means post-merge uh, post to pre-merge comparison. The comparison is a success, no regressions found. Yet it had found known issues, but they have been categorized. You can see that. There are changes in IGT. IGT is the test suite that we use. And we have, the, so something went from pass to incomplete. That incomplete means the machine died. And here is the bug associated with it. And then this one here, Camellium on KB Lake, pass to fail. And then you also have the other way around. Sometimes it goes from, well, failing to passing. So it, that means that your patch series may actually fix something. So that's a very interesting thing to know. Here it says from one to pass. OK, I didn't even have time to file a bug for this one, apparently. And here, uh, this particular failure actually matched not only one bug, but two bugs, just for fun. And, um, and it was seen in two different tests. That's what this plus one means here. Because sometimes you've got you know, like 500 tests that, uh, 
that go from pass to fail, and it's for the same reason. So having a, an insanely long report is not helping. Then at the top, you can see that there's links, and this is marked down. So as soon as we're going to, I mean, if you want to render this as HTML, then the links here will bring you straight to the URL there, so it's easier to see. Then you can see which hosts have been there. So there's only uh, four hosts disappearing because they were b busy doing something else probably. So you can see that they were not there. So if you were expecting something to be tested on particular on hardware, then it's not going to be seen. And the only thing that changed here is Linux. It went from this version to this version. If you want to get this version, you get it from there. It's this particular SHA at this address. And for IGT, it's this one. And for the patchwork, it's this um, pre-merge testing. Since it was a Linux thing, you can see here. And you can fetch it from the same place. And in the end, there were only three commits that were added. And you can see the three of them. So that's the report, an example of it. This is how uh, you file a filter. You have different tags on the left. That means. Um, um, so, for instance, if you've got multiple trees, Linux stable 4.14, or um, the, the latest integration tree here, we only do the integration tree, which is called DRM tip. But at some point, we're going to expand, and that's why we already have this feature here. Then you can select machines that are where it's visible. So either you select the actual machine, or you select a tag. So that means, for instance, Coffee Lake is a, a generation of hardware. We've got a lot of Coffee Lake machines. So we just tag them as, yeah, it's a Coffee Lake machine. And then it allows you to, you know, to create filters like this that are a bit more broad. And if there's a new Coffee Lake machine coming in, well, I don't have to change my filters. Because there's a shit ton of them. So yeah, and then you select the tests that, uh, that see the, uh, show the problem. Of course, everything is filterable, so you can look for them more easily. And then you select what is the, the status, like pass, fail, crash, whatever. And you can see that we also run Piglet, so it just so the warn of Piglet and the warn of IGT is not the same. <laughs> so you want to say this one. Yep. And then you have regular expressions that you can use on the STD out, the STDR, and the mask. So that's the way we right now we have signatures. Uh, I mean, yeah, we write the signatures. So far, it's been working pretty pretty well. And when you type, it tells you how many of the unknown values that have not been categorized yet are being matched by this. So you can see in real time if you're screwing up your regular expression or not. Oh, and also, when you actually screw it up, then it tells you what is the uh, error. And yesterday, a new machine got added. And that led to a lot of uh, new values that need to be categorized. Enjoy. That's what I was doing. Then what I was saying is that you need uh, a way to know how to prioritize things, because there's too many bugs. So you need to know how to prioritize them. So there is this view that shows the pass rate of, um, in, in the history. You can see that, for instance, here it went down it's because the not run, so the machi one machine started dying, probably. So it went, uh, it went a bit up and then down again. And you can see up, it's fine again. It's going to this 98% or so, something like this. And the most hitting bug on these platforms is this one. And you can see the hit rate is 0.73%. And that meant 2,707, well, whatever, test out of the for the entire history selected here was 400,000 test executions. And so of course, I mean, here it only shows the first two, but there's 81 that were caught. Then because developers also need help uh, knowing which uh, bugs they need to look at, when we have, I mean, we, we have an SLA on the, the bugs. So we say that we need to look at the bugs depending on the priority at a certain rate. So for instance, this one is a medium <laughs> priority. And that means that we, we have 60 days to, to comment on it. And the deadline is actually, oops, in 7 hours and 48 minutes. So that means that someone has to have a look. And then you can see who is actually involved there, who is a user, who is a developer. And this way, this, this is how you know when it was last updated by a user or a developer. So it helps you with the, the prioritization. So yeah, Intel Graphics CI. 
So a quick comparison with other, dry, uh, other CI systems. Zero day is really mostly build testing. It can do some other things, but it's not geared towards this. Uh, it's only anyway using some Intel servers. And the result latency is really way too slow to be used as pretty much. You cannot wait for the results. And you're not even sure you're going to see them. Because if it passes, you don't know that it passes. It's only when it fails that you know that. So then there's kernel CI, post-merge, distributed build, and boot testing. Very interesting project. And uh, very nice part is really that it's distributed. Um, the well, the problem is that it's just boot testing. I mean, come on. It's not exactly screaming quality if you boot. Uh, then there is, yes, no patches. Um, well, it's, it's not an actual instance. It's just uh, open source software, but it's, it's nice that is, um, there's something public that, that you can use. Then Intel Graphics CI, it builds, it boots, it runs IGT, which includes a lot of uh, suspend testing. It executes Piglet on quite a few hosts. It gets patches from the main list, just like Snowpatch, and sends automatic emails uh, with the, the results that uh, I've shown before. And it's mostly open source. It's not completely open source. There are some things that anyway we, are not, we don't really like, and we need to rework them. So we're not going to open source the bad parts. But the good parts, they are all out. And uh, 30 minutes for the basic tests, and si up to six hours for the full results. That's something that we really want to keep. OK, so our objectives really are to provide an accurate view of the, the state and hardware-software uh, hardware combination. And as we were saying before, yeah, it has to be transparent, fast, and visible, and stable. So that's, that's what we are trying to do. We here is just, it's, it's not really, uh, well, it's just a lot of data. It's, uh, if you want to watch again the stream or, or read the slides, then here it is. It's what we do, but I, I guess what is important is the address here, Intel Graphics CI 01.org. OK, so now what can we do? We can collaborate on the infrastructure. So there's a new community that got started at XDC after a testing workshop. And uh, this community really is aiming to make a distributed system like kernel CI, but then still having the, the nice part about the, well, the Intel Graphics CI and making it as a community that would be used by all the drivers, not just Intel. So right now, it's pretty much, I mean, public CI is there's only Intel in graphics for <coughs> Linux. And so I think we need to change this. Um, Yes, so you can see the URL. We just started with Jacobo. Um, you see, yeah, so <laughs> that's nice. Um, and yeah, this, we're just working basically on the interfaces and, and glossary for what we actually call what. And uh, this is going to be how we are going to create these, um, this open, open source toolbox, really. That's what we want to achieve. There's no single project that is going to work for everyone. So we want to have these components that can, you can mix and match and uh, deploy your own system on your own hardware. And, uh, but for this, we need to have good interfaces that make sense. And for this, we need more people contributing. The i915 uh, is the name of the Intel driver for Linux. So the infrastructure for it, whatever is open source, is uh, can be found at this address, again on GitLab. For IGT, you can so it's the test suite that is going to be um, talked about by Arek uh, in t in an hour. So what you can do is write new tests and improve the test. Um, well, the driver agnosti agno driver agnostics ones. Or you can write your own driver-specific ones. So AMD has been doing it, uh, Broadcom also, so it's not just Intel anymore. And uh, the funny part also is that we can write uh, create hardware that is meant for testing. Um, Google has made the Chameleon project that allows us to fake having screens connected. Then we can fake hot plugging or uh, verify if um, if encryption is working, or HDMI CEC actually is, is going to be a, there's going to be a talk about this, and Chameleon allows us to send these events as if someone had pressed the, the remote control. 
So it's really very powerful tools, and there's no way around this. So we need to collaborate there too. Okay, conclusion. CI makes upstream development easier, faster, and less buggy. It's not almost started like Daft Punk, but not really. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Any questions? I have a tough question for you. Uh, one thing, one thing is about uh, I, uh, I I can follow up uh, because uh, there are many many more bugs in the screen part when you output the uh, graphic to the screen. The color whether it's normal, uh, whether the, the, uh, we can output uh, use the full resolution of the screen. Uh, this tool cannot tell the result of that whether the screen output is normal, isn't it? It doesn't have the detecting of the actually result, but just the self-test of the codex itself, isn't it? Just a self-pipeline testing, something like that. Not actually detect the result. So, OK, it's hard to rephrase this question. Um, OK, I think I'll just explain something and, yeah. Um, so what basically you're, you're describing is what the test suite can do or not. It's well, the, the it can be do. I will mention an example of Samsung or the hot, pl hot plugin later. But I just say, in usually in our trip design company, what usually test we do, because you said we freeze our kernel, is about every screen whether it works normal and uh, in different color format, uh, color can can win the color space whether it will work, but I saw these two only can test. It's just like the self running without tracking the actual result, isn't it? But I want it, 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 it is only actual result. Well, of course, this tool is doing exactly what you're saying. It is just looking at the results and oh, finding signatures. Work. Well, that was this when you write filters. That's what it does. Here. Yeah. So, but you will use a sensor to watch your actual result, a camera to watch your actual result. What you're saying is just, can your test suite do something or not? And yes, yes we I, do. I actually, that's it. What it, it, it has just the self-testing for me. I, it's a separate question here. We are talking only about the tools. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To, to keep track of the results and curate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for graphics. It can be used for anything. As yeah. Well, I'll be in the hallway if you want to ask me anything. Mm.